I, say, I mean, we see that in the West as well. I mean, in Ireland, 80% of all suicides um, are by young men. You know, that is, again, I think, a an inability to express themselves because men have not traditionally been given, been given enough space under patriarchal, um, under patriarchal society um, to be vulnerable to because they see vulnerability or expressing that sort of emotion as being weak. And, yeah, and you attributed the, the, the uh, rates of mental illness among men to their inability to express, say, sentimental emotions. Well, and I don't think there's a shred of clinical evidence to support well, that stance. I, Deborah Yergelin Todd and her associates at Harvard have used sophisticated MRI imaging to examine how emotion is processed in the brains of children from the ages of 7 through 17. In boys, as in men, the part of the brain where emotions happen is not well connected to the part of the brain where verbal processing and speech happens, unlike the situation in teenage girls and in women. Asking a teenage boy to talk about how he feels is a question guaranteed to make most boys uncomfortable. You're asking him to make connections between two parts of his brain that don't normally communicate. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I mean, we see that in the West as well. I mean, in Ireland, 80% of all suicides um, are by young men. Yeah. Uh, men are four times more likely uh, to die by suicide than by women. Um, and, you know, that is, again, I think, a an inability to express themselves because men have not traditionally been given, been given enough space under patriarchal, um, uh, under patriarchal society um, to be vulnerable to because they see vulnerability or expressing that sort of emotion as being weak. Um, and that's why I think that the rates of um, mental health issues and suicide are so high amongst young men, particularly in Western mm. societies. Um, Jordan, Jordan pieces and I noticed, I, I don't think it was a, I, it'd be wrong to characterise it as a flinch, but a reaction when Louise was talking. You've written this as well. If men are pushed too hard to feminise, they will become more and more interested in harsh fascist political ideology. That seemed to me an odd thing to say. Um, it's I a mean, it's a psychoanalytic make... idea. It's it's not it, it's not a harsh thing to say at all. If you deny people's essential nature, competitive nature, for example, isn't it the there's classic going to be a kickback? And isn't it? Think it, of that as enculturated purely as just incorrect. Yes, but isn't it the classic abuser's exculpation? Uh, it's a it's a withdrawal from responsibility. Um, you pushed me to it. You made me hit you. It's, it's not a justification. Isn't... It's yeah. just an observation of what's likely. If you if you push people too far in a particular direction, it's a warning, not a justification. But the solution to that is not to worry about feminising men. It's perhaps to worry about men joining fascist organisations. No, I think it's to worry about the sorts of things that Lawrence already, already talked about and the probability that um, like steep, unequal hierarchies will produce desperate young men. And that's actually a critique of hierarchy, by the way. I, Louise O'Neill. Yeah, I, just, I have two points there. I suppose the first one is is that... When you talk about, you know, feminizing men, it almost sounds derogatory. It's almost as if you're saying that to be feminine or to express any sort of femininity is actually inferior to masculinity. Um, and I think that is a huge problem even with within the language that we use. You know, when you say, don't be such a girl, don't be such a pussy, the, the gracious insults that men can give each other tend to have feminine or origins, like, you know, as I said, pussy or faggot um, or anything like that. And I think, again, that speaks to... Um, a very systematic um, inequality uh, between the genders. Um, and, yeah, and you attributed the, the, the uh, rates of mental illness among men to... Not when you're talking about a, a, a transformation in behaviour that that's, that's that profound. I mean, we don't know how men and women can work properly together in the workforce. It's very complicated. But men do. don't know how to compete you know, millions with of women. men and women across the world go to yeah, work you together have, day but, in, well, day out. You, but you're the one so, who asked about Me you're Too. The one me who, too is, start with you're the one who. Me Too is a, well, Me Too is an expression of the fact that men and women are having a hard time regulating their behaviour in the workplace. That's the only reason I responded to that, because the question well, was I think posed. it's more broadly suggesting that, that, that some men are having a grave problem with it. What is the lesson of the Harvey Weinstein story for you? Someone should have said something about Harvey Weinstein much sooner. But we could start somewhere else. We could start with Harvey Weinstein was wrong to do what he did before we get yes, around well, I, to yes, yes. Other, other people should have spoken look, out. It's fair, just, that's look, the secondary no, no, order issue. Fair enough, fair enough. I thought that went without saying. There are going to be psychopathic predators. They're going to exist. And what has to happen is that people have to stop them because they won't stop themselves. And so I thought that was sort of implicit in the statement. Obviously, he shouldn't have done what he did. But you don't think that the culture in which he was operating, that there was particularly in his in world... Hollywood? In, in his world and in many other worlds that there was a culture of, you know, let this guy's a powerful guy, he's the great silverback gorilla here, let him get on with it. 
Oh, I think that culture was everywhere in Hollywood, which is why I think Not it's just actually Hollywood? quite... Well, Hollywood particularly. I mean, the casting couch idea has been around for a very long period of time. And I think that the Hollywood types who are all upset about this should look to their own devices with regards to the role they've played in fostering the culture that managed that. So, so yeah, it sounds like the, the well, Hollywood, Hollywood itself, or you've the got women, to think, or who? who no, no, the entire culture. Said, we right? talk, We were talking about culture. Yes. So, I mean, it's certainly that the, the, the Hollywood... But, What's the sensible thing for women to do about Me Too, to your mind? And what's the less sensible thing? That, that's a hard question. It, it isn't obvious to me exactly what men and women have to do in the workplace to make that kind of sexual predation much less likely with all, also subjecting themselves to restrictions on the sexual element, aspect of their existence that would be unbearable. It's very difficult. What, what would be unbearable about that? How about everybody wears the same uniform to work? That's, that's what the Maoists... Well, look, if you want to eliminate the differences between men and women sexually at the workplace, you have to constrain the sexual differences. I mean, men wear suits to work. Well, we right? don't have to eliminate the sexual differences for people to work together with respect. You have to eliminate them to some degree. Why? I'm genuinely well, because you're trying puzzled. to... You're try the question here is... To what degree should sexually related behavior be impermissible at the workplace? Well, yes. it depends on how you define it. Should you be able to dress attractively? And if you can dress attractively, what do you mean by attractively exactly? Like precisely? Uh -huh. I got right, into so, trouble. I mean, I, I hope I dressed nicely today. You look very well dressed to me, right? You're a man, I'm a woman. We're both nicely dressed. Now we're getting on with the interview. What's the problem or perspective? Well, the problem, problem is, is is the boundaries of what constitutes nicely dressed. Because mm. there's, look, because part of what constitutes attractiveness, part of what constitutes nicely dressed is sexual attractiveness. Because you can't separate out human attractiveness, sexual attractiveness from human attractiveness. And so then the question is exactly where are the boundaries? And that's what the discussion is about. Where are the boundaries? The uh, dinner parties, which are described in a foreword to your book, where friends enjoy debates and disagreements, do you think in the broader conversation we've lost that spirit or in danger of losing that spirit? Oh, I think, I think we're always in danger of losing that spirit, right? Because lack of freedom is much more probable than freedom. We have to be very careful to maintain that because it's always under threat. Um, but and I do feel that it's under threat now. I think that people are very careful about what they say in ways that aren't good. Um, could you please discuss free will and Sam Harris's and others' ideas of its non-existence? Well, that's a good, complicated question to kick things off. So I want to tell you a little bit about how to conceptualize free will, I think, first, because it's obvious that we don't have infinite free will. Our, our choice, Our choices are constrained in all sorts of ways. And I think part of the reason that there's a a continual discussion about free will in the philosophical. <laughs> Just conceptualizing the issue properly is extraordinarily difficult. So I like to think about it, at least in part, the way that you think about a game. You know, if you're playing a game, obviously the game has rules. So if it's a chess game or a basketball game, then there are things that you can do and, and things that you can't do. And but and so it, it's a it's a it's a closed world in some sense. But the fact that there are things you can't do when you play a game also seem to open up a universe of possibilities for things that you can do. So chess obviously constrains you to a board and to a certain number of men and to a certain pattern of rules. But the strange thing is, is that when you put in those rules, because rules sound like limits, they sound always like things you can't do. But when you set up a constrained world like that and you lay out a system of rules, what you do is open up an infinity of, of a near infinity of possibilities. Same with music, you know, music has rules, obviously. And, and if you follow the rules, then you can make an infinite variety of music. And so, and so there's a there's a very interesting dynamic that's hard to understand between constraint and possibility. And there's a deep idea that's associated with that that I read in some Jewish commentary on on the biblical stories that I I read a long time ago um, talking about the relationship between God and man and the idea was that God 
imagine a being with the classical attributes of God, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. What does a being like that lack? And obviously the answer is nothing, right? Because by definition, those three traits provide for absence of limitation. But then that's exactly what's lacking, is limitation. And there's some strange connection between limitation and, and I was saying, say, limitation that, that's rule-governed, as I mentioned before, and the opening up of possibility. So that isn't necessary.